Hello and welcome to this virtual symposium, Informatics for Effective Drug Discovery. This event is jointly hosted by Optibrium Limited and Collaborative Drug Discovery Incorporated. I'm Tim Holm and I will be more your moderator for this event today. We are excited to be joined by our guest speakers, Peter Monecke from Sanofi and Liz B. Kokemer from the Center of Medicines Discovery at the University of Oxford. During the coming two and a half hours, we will provide you with a snapshot of perspectives how informatics is shaping modern drug discovery, rounded off with our panel discussion where our guest speakers will be joined by Optibrium CEO Matt Siegel and CDD CEO Barry Bunin to discuss their outlook on the future of drug discovery and the role of informatics. We welcome your questions and will try to cover as many as time permits after each presentation. Please use the questions panel in the sidebar to submit your questions. You can do that throughout all the presentations. And before jumping into today's presentations, I would like to briefly set the stage. You will be familiar with such representations of the early drug discovery process. And as we will see during today's presentations, CDD Vault and Opterium Stardrop provide comprehensive support for your compound management and the process from target selection through to lead optimization. CDD developed Vault, a complete SAAS database for chemists and biologists for registering compounds, tracking inventory, managing biological assay data, and it includes an integrated electronic lab notebook. Optibrium Stardrop is a complete package for small molecule design, optimization, and data analysis. As we will demonstrate, both applications easily integrate and work together, enhancing the effectiveness of your drug discovery process. Together, Stardrop and CDD Vault support the complete discovery workflow, including hit and lead series analysis, SAR analysis, lead optimization and design, down to sharing newly optimized leads and registering these compounds in your database systems. With this, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Charlie Weatherall. Charlie is Director of Customer Engagement with CDD, and he manages the pre-sales and support team. Charlie will demonstrate CDD Vault and how it enables your compound and assay management, as well as searching and sharing of data. That, let me hand over the screen to Charlie. Charlie, you're up now. Thank you very much. I hope my slide is coming through now with the circle effect. Um, so hello everyone, thanks for joining us today. Um, I am going to start with a brief introduction with slides to our company, Collaborative Drug Discovery, as well as our platform for drug discovery data management, CDD Vault. So I'll start here with a view of a timeline of drug discovery from the Eli Lilly website. Uh, CDD focuses mainly on the top layer of this funnel where, as you know, there's a lot of data uh, that needs to be organized during this process. Scientists are coming up with thousands and analyzing thousands of millions of different types of entities, uh, whether they be small molecules, cell lines, antibodies, um, all throughout their drug discovery process. There's usually hundreds to thousands of different types of assays being run across all of these entities. And these assays or protocols need to be devised, annotated, and ultimately reduced to a definition for the kinds of data being captured for later analysis. Once that's done, we are acquiring millions and millions, even billions of rows of data from all over the place like CROs, partners, academic screening centers, et cetera. Sometimes this data is generally um, being generated across the globe. Once generated, this data needs to be accessible to a collection of very serious, thoughtful, well-educated, and often stressful, uh, stressed out scientists who need to be able to access this data in many different ways. And finally, all of this data gets pulled together and summarized in all sorts of documents and reports containing structured and unstructured data. 
for decades, we've all used various tools to manage the people and the data being generated from paper notebooks to flat files, various desktop tools, complicated mainframe database applications, and so on. And working with all of these tools resulted in an array of unique challenges. But we feel, of course, there is a new way, a better way of doing things, and that's what CDD Vault represents. CDD Vault combines many of the features of all of these previous tools into one easy to use cloud-based platform. With zero footprint, it is intuitive to use and requires no IT support. Training is provided and customers are taken into full deployment within a matter of one to two hours. As Tim mentioned, CDD Vault provides a variety of feature sets for the registration of your entities and biological assay data, an inventory system, a visualization tool where you can analyze data, and also an electronic laboratory notebook for documenting all of the research, including your unstructured data. As we go through this process with our customers, we get you started up and running very quickly. There's minimal training required, and you have control of all of your projects and protocol. The system is also very easy to use, and since it's so intuitive, there's a high adoption rate among the scientists. With security built in, your data is protected, safe, and secure. CDD Vault also grows with you, and the support team can do more than just figure out which buttons to push. They also help you understand best practices for handling your data. The system scales and grows, and we provide an API, that's an application programmable interface, to connect with the rest of your ecosystem, such as Uptibrium Stardrop. CDD has been in business for 16 years, and we've always been cloud-based. Through our partnerships with organizations such as Uptibrium, we provide a full solution for drug discovery informatics. Just a quick teaser, also I wanted to mention, coming soon is a, a new BioHarmony. Um, we're very excited to announce this new platform that includes a variety of technological technologies uh, to provide consolidated semantic data on approved drugs that can be used across all levels of your drug discovery organization. So I think that is plenty with the PowerPoint slides, probably too much, and I will go uh, directly now into the CDD Vault system. I am logged in here just like uh, to the same system, just like our customers are logging in day in and day out across the globe. I like to start with a report like this because I believe it shows the types of data that our customers are using CDD Vault for to organize, mine, analyze, and report and share, collaborate, if you will, on the data being generated. If you'll notice, there's a column of small molecules. So if you are doing small molecule drug discovery, we do offer a full chemical registration system where we will detect duplicate structures upon registration. We will strip salts and solvates um, and perform a variety of uh, calculations um, to give you a set of chemical properties based on those structures. Now, of course, there's a lot of drug discovery going on that do, does not involve small molecules, so CDD Vault can certainly uh, help uh, you store and track um, and manage all of the data being generated on these biological entities that may not include um, small molecules. The next section of my report represents a series of data fields um, for the various batches that you can register for your entities being uh, tested and registered into CDD Vault. Now, we do understand the concept of multiple batches. You may have to synthesize a compound or order a compound multiple times, and we will easily keep track of all of those different batches and the data associated with them. These batch fields that you're seeing here in this uh, section of the report are all controlled by the customer's vault administrator. So that means they are self-service. They are created by the users, the customers, um, and are available for the users who are populating and registering their entities and compounds. They can enforce business rules around these batch fields, whether they be required or whether the values in these being registered in these fields are unique. So all of this is under your complete and full control. These batch fields can contain numeric data, text, dates, even file attachments. Um, if they are common file attachments like image files, we'll show a nice thumbnail of those. Otherwise, they'll just be the 
file name. Um, it'll be blue and your users will understand that they can click those files to open them in a window. Another special field that we offer here at the batch level is the ELN entry. Um, this is beginning to paint the picture of a completely integrated platform of structured and unstructured data coming together to, to really fully document and fully describe and annotate your drug discovery process. Whenever a batch of a compound or an entity is registered or linked to from an ELN entry, you automatically get this link. So this means that this batch of this molecule um, was registered from an ELN entry. And if I go over to that ELN entry, you'll see that we have a um, example of a synthesis here where we've drawn a chemical reaction. Gets, gives us a full stoichiometry table here where I can interact with this stoichiometry table in edit mode and add reagents, or I can simply draw the reagents above or below the arrow in my reaction. For any of the reaction components that may already be registered in your vault, we will automatically show you the molecule ID, and also any that are not or that you wish to register again, maybe another batch, um, we give you the opportunity to register any of these reaction components into your registration system. As I scroll down through this ELN canvas, you'll notice all of the different uh, places are documented here. Uh, we have a Word file that is dropped in. We do offer and provide a full integration with Microsoft Office. So if I clicked this uh, Word icon, this file would be opened and we could edit that in line or directly here within the ELN. I can also choose to change the preview size of this Office document. So I could click that diagonal arrow and the document would open here in line for viewing within my ELN canvas. Uh, scrolling down, we also can insert just chemical structures so they don't have to be reactions. And again, if I hover over this chemical structure, you can see the opportunity to register this in my re registration system. But I can also see here that this compound already exists in my CDD vault registration system with an ID of OC203. So we'll take a quick detour and go to the OC203 molecule here. And you can see all of the information just by clicking through on that molecule ID that's available in my entire CDD Vault platform. So all of the chemical properties that we've calculated based on the chemical structure are here. You can see there is a tab to contain all of the batches. So batch one was actually registered from that ELN page. You can see that link here. So again, however you discover this molecule, however you come across and start investigating this molecule, there's always uh, these links or these hints that there's more information in other parts of the platform. Very easy, very obvious, very intuitive that you can click through and see additional data. All of the batch fields are populated. This particular molecule happens to have two batches. And then also there's a links tab. So you can now see all of the places where this molecule has been linked to throughout your entire system. So again, this links tab provides a nice uh, way to discover where this molecule has been mentioned throughout the CDD Vault platform. For your assay data for this molecule, you can see any plates or assays or protocols where this data um, that have data for these particular two batches of this compound, if you have collections and which projects they belong to. So again, a complete report card of this particular molecule is available uh, just by clicking on this molecule ID, and that includes the links out to all of the places where data may be discovered. So I will go back to the ELN entry now and just scroll through here um, and at the end, we have some viability study here, tables here. And if I hover over this CSV file, that is a data file that would match a protocol definition uh, that I've created in my vault. So if I wanted to register uh, this, these results into a protocol, uh, I could click this import button here and directly from my ELN register this assay results data. If I wanted to visualize that data in an Excel file, again, I could open that in Excel, or I could just click this diagonal arrow, and that data file will be here, complete with scroll bars. All right, so now I will scroll back up here. The ELN does contain um, a full set of features, so you can finalize your ELN entries, duplicate your ELN entries, export those out, and see a full audit trail as well. 
Now I'll go back to this search results table and we'll focus our attention on the right side now of this report. Here is where we have used two different protocol containers or protocol definitions to import and track and analyze results from different assays or tests that you've performed across these compounds or entities. The first one's a primary inhibition test where we have done a uh, measurement of percent inhibition. And you can notice not only are we offering percent inhibitions, but we have now also automatically given you an average. So you can add custom calculations to these protocol containers. So that if you test a batch and replicate, for example, we will keep track of the individual measurements, but also automatically give you um, an average of those. Very easy to set these protocol containers up, and they can contain data fields for numbers and text. They can contain a uh, pick list or controlled vocabulary so that you can uh, not have uh, typos coming in uh, when the data is imported or registered into these protocol definitions. These protocols can also contain file attachments, and just like the file attachments to the batch fields, if they are common or known image types or PDFs, we will generate a nice thumbnail that's displayed right here in line uh, in a report table. Uh, otherwise, we would just show the file name. Now for this dose response assay, this protocol is configured to take uh, individual measurements at a variety of concentrations, both on the samples being tested and your positive and or negative controls. And with that information, we can calculate IC50s and generate live dose response curves right here within the system. I can click on this flag outliers to open that curve in a window. And if I click on any of the points here on the curve, those will be flagged as an outlier. I can also constrain the min, max, and hill slope parameters uh, right here on a curve by curve basis. Now that I've flagged my outlier, if I save these changes, notice the curve is redrawn here and back in the application. If I close my window now. The IC50 value in the report table is now italicized and underlined. And if I hover over that, I can see that this value was calculated excluding outliers. So again, it's very intuitive. The scientists can take a look at this report, all of the data being generated, and easily understand uh, when things like outliers are flagged and so forth. So that's a quick tour of the types of data. Of course, a very brief uh, introduction here. Um, once you have uh, performed a search and you're at a search results table or report like this, uh, the header here has a few options uh, of things that you can accomplish or achieve. Uh, one thing you can always do is export your data out if you need to. So if I click export, uh, you will see you can export into Excel format, CSV, or an SD file. If you choose one of the Excel formats, XLSX, any thumbnail images that we've generated, any dose response plots, and your chemical structure are all exported out into Excel as vector graphic publication quality images. So it's very easy to get images of those uh, thumbnails and chemical structures. You can also add a, to a collection or create a collection of compounds here. Uh, collections are very nice because they're very searchable and they're also easy um, to share and collaborate with other users. So if my search uh, in, resulted in a set of compounds that were very interesting and I needed to share those with my collaborators in the vault, <coughs> excuse me, I can click add to a collection here. So now I would say, you know, my best candidates in November. Now I could either make this a private collection or if I'm interested, I could share this uh, with a project here in my vault. And if I share this, that means other users in the system could log in and then take advantage and search and view the data in this collection. So once I click save, um, it tells me that that collection was indeed saved and it immediately gives me the opportunity to share this collection. So now if I click share, I can choose a particular user or select all of my users. But if I wanted to share these particular compounds with Tamsin, I could say, hi Tamsin, please review these. You would type better than I did ASAP. So what's going to happen if I post this message is Tamsin is going to get an email um, and Tamsin's going to in that email see this link to 
this collection within my CDD Vault. So as long as Tamsin can log into CDD Vault, she can click that link and come in immediately to these three compounds. So collections are a very nice collaborative tool when you have compounds or entities um, that you would like to share with your collaborators within your vault. I won't send that at this time, so I'm going to X that out. We do have a quick Bayesian activity modeling uh, algorithm uh, incorporated directly into CDD Vault. So if you wanted to um, rank your unknown compounds from most likely to be good to least likely to be good based on a set of known good molecules, you can do that as well. Um, and after any search, you can also customize your report. If I click this and customize my report, you will see all of the data fields available to me in my vault that I can now turn on in that search results table. So the chemical properties are here in a section where I can turn on the log D if I'm interested. Uh, for the batch fields, maybe I want to see the unique molecule batch ID or a salt or formula weight if I'm interested. Uh, you can see for the various protocols or assays, all of the information that's also available that I can choose to display within my report. If I update my report now, those new columns uh, will be displayed. There's the log D. I think I turned on that unique ID as well. And then finally, I can save this search. So I'll hold off on that for one moment. I'm going to scroll up and let's talk a little bit about searching within CDD Vault. You can create multi-parameter queries here to search across all parts of your CDD Vault in one intuitive, nice query. So here in the search menu, I can search across those protocols or assay data. I can either search across one or combine those together uh, with the AND and OR Boolean logic. You can also include a structure-based query to your search. So if I had a fragment or a core that I was interested in, I could do a substructure or a Tanamoto similarity query across those. And I could also uh, narrow my search results based on any of those chemical properties that we calculate. In this example, I have chosen to uh, just narrow those down to compounds in a molecular weight range. And then finally, I can uh, perform keyword searches across any of the other uh, data fields there. So after I've performed my query, I could do a quick search here and just say, show me everything that is in my dose response, add a term, and in my inhibition study, um, click search here. And that's basically going to be a very quick query to pull back any data that's tested in both of those assays. And now I can customize my report to turn on additional data if I wanted to and save this search. Um, as a, a safe search here that other users in this vault can use. So I'm saving this search for Tamsin, and I'm going to choose the project here. And once I create that, um, it will say that that has been successfully saved. Now up here, uh, you have a save searches tab, and I do want to point that out because I saved the search uh, for Tamsin um, uh, very specifically with a purpose in mind here. Uh, our integration with the Optibrium's, Optibrium Stardrop um, will actually be able to uh, go into my CDD vault from Stardrop and execute any of these save searches. So in a bit, when Tamsin has um, her turn to demo, uh, she will see all of these save searches that are available and shared within the CDD vault, and she can execute and pull that data, um, the results from these searches, if you will, directly into Stardrop. So that forms kind of the background or backbone of our integration with Stardrop. So that was my quick tour. I do want to do uh, one more quick show and tell. I won't say too much about this, but just to prove that uh, it's not all small molecules. Um, we do also allow our customers, and many customers are uh, using CDD Vault to um, store other types of entities and the data they're generating about them. So uh, here's an example here uh, where we are storing uh, plasmids in a CDD vault, have all of the information included, the including the plasmid map uh, about that, the sequence information, uh, so forth and so on, the construct validation, so forth. So this all, all of this information can be stored and available as well. Um, within CDD Vault, even for um, entities that are not small molecules. And with that, I will turn it back over to Tim. Thank you very much. Thanks, Charlie.
Um, I think we have time for at least one or two very brief questions. We will get back to the remaining questions that I've seen ticking in throughout your presentation, Charlie, afterwards by mail. But Thank two you. quick ones. Um, one question was, if I have an ELN which isn't CDD, CDD's ELN, can I and how can I connect that with my vault? Yeah, most excellent question. Thank you very much. Um, so we do have customers who have other ELNs in place, and we have a full application programmable interface, that API that I spoke about earlier. Um, just like we've used the API to integrate with um, Optibrium Stardrop, we could also integrate with other ELNs so that compounds maybe could be registered directly from other vendors' ELNs directly into your CDD Vault registration system. Um, and it is a two-way API, so you could take data out of CDD Vault or push data into CDD Vault using this API. So you could absolutely write um, integrations with other vendors, applications, even ELNs. Perfect. Thanks, Charlie. Another quick one is, is it possible to create dummy projects that allow you to upload compounds without registering them? This would work as kind of a sandbox. Yeah, so um, our customers do this in, in a couple of different strategies or scenarios. Uh, number one, they can have a separate vault that is a completely separate vault for a sandbox or play area. That's very common um, amongst our customer base. Um, but then, yes, you can also have um, QC or, or projects to hold data that might not yet be validated or, or you know, uh, the QC check not done with it. So um, the, the workflow there would be um, you know, the users would upload the data into one of these QC projects, and then once it is uh, the data is validated or verified, it can be very easily moved into a project that more all of the users, you know, have access to. Thanks, Charlie. And now it is my my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Peter Monaco. Peter is an organic chemist by education and a chem informatician um, by heart. As a veteran in Sanofi's drug discovery R&D, he combines nine years in computer-aided drug design with eight years leading the physicochemical wet lab in Frankfurt. This combination of drug design experience with deep insights in the wet lab processes and data management approaches was the foundation to his successful participation in the recent solubility challenge he will be discussing in his talk. During his career, Peter has experienced various cheminformatics platforms and has become a key opinion leader driving Sanofi's approach to drug discovery. He recently joined the in silico toxicology group at Sanofi, and as Peter likes to see, uh, say, evil mutagenic compounds, take care, the Peter will come to predict you. So in that spirit, let me hand over control to Peter. Thank you very much, Tim, for this kind of introduction. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's working now. Was too fast. Yeah, today I want to speak about the solubility challenge of 2019, which was a competition to predict the solubility of compounds. It was started in May of 2019 by Antonio Linas at the FISCAM forum here at Sanofi in Frankfurt um, as a competition to predict the intrinsic solubility of compounds. So, intrinsic solubility is the solubility of the neutral form of the compound starting from the most stable crystal packages. Um, the initiators of the solubility challenge uh, submitted two test sets of drug-like molecules, one with 100 molecules, which comprise a tight set, meaning that um, uh, they have a low interlap deviation. D uh, different uh, labs, they were tested uh, with the same value. And one set, with a higher interlap deviation, which means that it is a little bit more um, difficult to measure. Um, the authors of the challenge uh, provided, interestingly, um, the general solubility equation as a benchmark for estimating the um, solubility of the compounds. This um, equation contains only two um, experimental uh, values, uh, of log p and melting point to estimate or give a rough estimation of the um, um, uh, solubility of a compound. Of course, um, this is not suited for um, early compounds or virtual compounds because you uh, do not know the melting point of early compounds or virtual compounds. 
In total, uh, 20 contributors uh, participated in this solubility challenge and could uh, submit up to three different predictions. The results were revealed uh, two months ago in the same journal as uh, the solubility challenge was uh, initiated. And I will today present some evaluations and uh, some deeper insights from a point of view of a participant. Um, it was uh, important for the authors to state that the solubility challenge aimed not to identify a winner. It was just to see um, how advanced uh, or uh, see the advance in our general understanding of predictive models. Uh, solubility at Sanofi is usually measured um, in well-defined aqueous buffers, mostly pH 7.4, which uh, mimics uh, pH in the blood, which is the most uh, important condition, experimental condition. We measure thermodynamic solubility in equilibrium, mainly based on dry DMSO stock solution, because um, this is nicely optimizable. The majority of data are, were measured in the past uh, in the Frankfurt Fuschem lab, and I took part in the solubility challenge as a lab head of this uh, lab and wanted to see um, whether we can um, use our high quality experimental data combined with our state of the art modeling techniques um, and how this compares to other um, participants in this challenge um, out of uh, global FIS, uh, or global chemoinformatic community. We usually measure the solubility in a range from 1 to 1,000 micromolar, which is indicated by bold uh, lines. Uh, this translates, um, uh, 1 micromolar translates to a log S of minus 6, and 1,000 micromolar translates into a log S of minus 3. What you can see here in the uh, area above this uh, upper um, bold black line, there's a a wide range of insolubles where we are more or less blind. We, we do not have uh, data points to um, as pillars to, to identify or to quantify this range. These compounds are usually for us uh, just insolubles. Of course, within these insolubles, there is a differentiation. For instance, in the upper com uh, compound and the, this compound, there's a um, one and a half order of magnitude uh, between them in solubility. But uh, this is as if you would compare the solubility of a brickstone with a limestone. Uh, limestone is maybe a little bit more soluble, but uh, the overall solubility of both is um, insoluble. The same is true for the solubles. We do not uh, differentiate well soluble from extremely well soluble compounds and focus only um, in the in-between um, solubility range, which is, gives us the most information whether a compound um, is soluble to the extent of the IC50 or if uh, there are solubility problems and so on. Uh, to know um, or more about the experimental error and solubility determination, I went in our, to our database and selected all compounds that were tested more than two times um, in different salt forms. It's there were about 500 and um, I calculated the root mean square error to get an estimation about the precision or about the deviation um, in our uh, solubility measurements. This will become important later and I will mention it again then. The next step um, was the conversion of Sanofi in-house buffered solubility data to intrinsic solubility. Since I have mentioned um, the intrinsic solubility um, is the solubility of the neutral form. We cannot um, take always the pH 7.4 as solubility because if the compound is a base or an acid, then it's already um, uh, protonated or deprotonated at these measurement conditions and not neutral. Therefore, I applied um, PKA estimations of ACD um, to identify the pH range of neutral compounds in solution and had a look whether in our database, there is um, a solubility data point at this pH value. We had a lot of data points with out of range, meaning below one micromolar or above uh, 1,000 micromolar. And for these compounds, I applied 
um, the solubility estimation of the ACD program, but only for out of range uh, compounds, just to um, uh, um, stretch the, uh, the productivity range a little bit more to the insolubles and to the solubles, where we are in our assay are typically blind. This uh, conversion of uh, solubility data to intrinsic solubility um, yielded a final data set of 66,000 compounds, uh, covering the whole Sanofi chemical space um, in early research. Um, the next step, I took um, 205 marketed drugs, which included all the 132 challenge uh, compounds, and selected subsets um, around these 205 marketed drugs. Um, to each um, of these uh, 205 compounds, I assigned the most similar five or 20 or 100 compounds from the 66,000 uh, data set with the hypothesis that the higher number, number of similar compounds um, around the compound to predict in the training set increases the accuracy of the model. Um, I contributed uh, three, entirely three models uh, to the solubility challenge, and the encoding is uh, PMSA. Uh, the smallest model uh, used about 700 compounds in the training set. Uh, it is a model with uh, up to five uh, next neighbors. Um, the mid model was 2,000, and the biggest model with up to 100 next neighbors was about 8,000 um, compounds in the training data set. Um, the models were generated with Stardrop, um, uh, more precisely with the Automodeler module in Stardrop that we have um, here at Sanofi for a couple of years. Um, this Automodeler module um, describes the molecules with 10 whole molecule descriptors like uh, log P or molecular weight flexibility charge and up to th uh, 320 smart descriptors. The smart descriptors are on a binary fingerprint of O and 1, like uh, Max fingerprint or ECFT4, but just account how often uh, this uh, smarts pattern uh, can be found in a molecule. Of course, um, finally, not uh, 330 uh, descriptors are used uh, for metal creation, but uh, roughly 170 out of them uh, are selected, which um, are the most descriptive ones um, to learn the model. Uh, for data sets of uh, 5,000 or 10,000 or 20,000, um, there are usually um, three methods available in Automodeler, the partial least square, PLS, as the fastest uh, and I call it the cheapest model, then random forest and radial basis function. I tried all three um, um, model techniques um, and had a look which uh, gave the best prediction in the test set. Um, what you can see here is that uh, the radial basis function is the best in terms of R square of the 0 0.76 versus random forest of 0 0.7 and PLS of 0 0.6. Uh, this is in line with my experience with um, many other models like Kako or LockD and other. And the other point why I like the radial basis function so much is that the slope of the regression line, uh, which is shown here in a little more bold uh, line, it's closer to the line of unity, which is a diagonal. That means the intrinsic bias of the, of the RBF model is less than the um, intrinsic bias of the random forest. And um, although it, it seems that uh, the, the points scatter a lot around the line of diagonal, but you have to keep in mind that you see here in each of these plots roughly 2,000 data points, and the outliers um, have more weight, uh, visually more weight, um, than all these compounds that are uh, put together near the line of unity. Um, the authors of the solubility challenge um, used uh, four. Uh, measures for predictivity assessment. They used uh, the root mean square arrow, uh, the formula shown below. They used um, R square here as a prediction based on the mean, which is a rudimentary 
model. It is not the uh, square of the Pearson correlation coefficient. They use the bias, which is a measure for systematic amber and over prediction, and the fraction of correct predictions within half a log unit, which translate into a factor of uh, three in the non-logarithmic uh, solubility uh, range. Okay, showing some um, some tables of results. Um, here on the left side, you see all the 20 contributors um, of the solubility challenge. Uh, and in the first line, the general solubility equation as a reference, which is shown here as a, uh, as a scatter plot, where on the x axis you see the revealed uh, real experimental data of um, the solubility challenge, and on the y axis, the uh, easiest prediction of solubility or estimation just using log p and melting point. The second column uh, contains the number of submitted models um, up to three uh, or predictions up to three predictions could be submitted for each uh, contributor. Some did it, uh, some uh, only one, but um, never mind. Uh, the gray color um, was already introduced by the authors of the solubility challenge. It means uh, it's a possibly overlap between a training set and the challenge prediction set. It means um, it's, uh, just from the sheer number of data that were used from literature data set, it can be um, uh, uh, concluded that uh, not all um, challenge compounds were removed from the training set, which was one prerequis requisition uh, for the challenge. Um, as you remember, um, I mentioned that there are two data sets, set one with a, a low interlap deviation and set two with a high interlap deviation. I color, try to color code or try to um, make it visually more um, uh, clear. Um, I color coded uh, the following way. I took the general solubility equation as a reference and then for each column took the best value of each column and divided the difference or the range between the GSE as a reference and the best value of this um, um, column um, divided by half. And the worst half range of difference between GSE and uh, best prediction is colored in yellow. It means the half uh, of 0.22 and 0.64 is, um, or the range is um, 0.42. Half of them is 0.21 and 0.22 plus 0.21 is 0.33. All um, uh, contributions with 0.22 to 0.43 are colored yellow, and uh, from 0.43 to 0.64 are colored in green. And I did it independently for each column for root mean square error, for absolute bias, and for um, uh, percent within half a log unit. Uh, what you can see that uh, the set two is in all contribute contributions worse uh, in terms of predictivity than set one. It means this is not only uh, difficult to measure, but also difficult to predict. Since we in our daily work do not uh, distinguish whether uh, in our prediction, if we apply our models to new compounds, we do not distinguish whether a compound is difficult to measure or easy to measure, I combined these two data sets of 100 plus, plus 32 um, to yield 132. And this is the evaluation I did. Uh, this, this is not given by the authors of the, of the challenge in contrast to these two tables, but this is was redone by me just to see uh, what is the overall um, uh, predictivity. Uh, finally, my model is here marked with an orange um, arrow. My prediction, my best prediction was uh, showed to be 51% within the half a log unit. Al almost no absolute bias, which is great. Um, Many other contributors have a bias about 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and so on. Um, my models provide no over and no, no systematic over and no systematic under prediction. And the RMSE is okay with 0 0.91. Since I have mentioned that I'm more or less blind in the area below 10 to minus six uh, mole per liter and above 10 to minus three, uh, I limited the evaluation to the uh, compounds in the blue box. These are 94 uh, compounds, um, and um, 
it was great to see that um, in the area where I feel comfortable, where also uh, I provide the measurements, um, the uh, precision or the uh, productivity in terms of half a lock unit uh, increases to 62, and the RMSE uh, uh, increases by 0.2, maintaining the uh, great absolute bias of almost zero. Another view of this data, I um, show again this um, boldly marked uh, table here. I rank ordered all the contributions by RMSE, root mean square error, by absolute bias, and by percent within half a log unit. Um, the, oh, it's a little bit distorted. Um, the, the general solubility equation is marked by a, a black arrow in each um, of these bar charts, and my contributions um, by red, you know, by, by orange arrows. Um, of course, you see here that, um, okay, I can't see the arrows in the bottom, uh, but never, never mind. Um, it was great for me to see that at least one of my model, PMSAC, is always in top three of all um, um, measurements or measures of uh, precision. Um, as I have mentioned in the beginning, um, my hypothesis was um, the more next neighbors you use to um, enrich the neighborhood around, the chemical neighborhood around a compound, the better uh, the prediction gets. In total, I created nine models with different number of next neighbors. Um, only three of them submitted, um, PMSCB with five neighbors, PMSCA with 20, PMSC, uh, PMSAC with 100 neighbors. Um, seeing uh, or looking at um, uh, the, the combined set of 132, the RMSE is more or less constant um, over the whole range of uh, next neighbors. But interestingly, looking at the fraction within half a log unit, I observe that uh, it starts to increase from 39% at, with two neighbors uh, to 53% um, with up to um, in the uh, model with up to 50 neighbors, but then decreases again to 43. That means there is some optimum of next neighbors in coverage of the chemical space. This was surprisingly, very surprisingly for me. I pressed. Ah, exactly. Um, as I have already mentioned, um, I am blind in this um, uh, gray um, uh, box. I uh, folded back all compounds, all predictions that are um, located here in this black box, in this uh, gray box, in this gray circle here at minus six, and all which are on the upper uh, right um, uh, box to this uh, circle here reflecting the measurement range in my lab. Uh, same picture, we start with 59, of course, a little bit higher because uh, the deviation of the insoluble uh, is now zero because it is uh, projected on the line of diagonal, but I increase the productivity up to 76, 67%. Uh, that means uh, in my best models with 50 or 100 next neighbors, I predict uh, correct solubility of the challenge data within half a log unit, which is a great uh, achievement. And if I loosen a little bit uh, the, um, uh, the range uh, and say I accept uh, plus minus one log unit, it's of course not the correct number, but a good estimation whether a compound is soluble, uh, mid soluble, or insoluble. Um, I increase the, um, the precision to 91%, which means uh, 10 out of 11 compounds are correct predicted within one log unit. Um, what I have uh, said by words that you uh, get uh, some kind of uh, bell shaped curve, uh, you can see here um, in, um, in a scatter plot, nice uh, bell shaped uh, curve. And um, this was surprising to me because uh, theory says um, 
take more compounds uh, to represent the chemical space and get better results. Obviously, um, is more not always better. You know, more is more, but only better is better. And we see here, um, do not take too much. I tried to rationalize um, this behavior and uh, assumed that um, there are two contributions uh, to this to form this bell-shaped behavior. One negative is the noise, which increases linearly uh, with increasing number of compounds. Here, the x-axis is a log um, unit, uh, or a log scale of next neighbors, and the learning curve, um, which is a kind of sigmoidal, um, which um, approaches a saturation because if you add more than 50 or 100 uh, compounds, you do not add more um, uh, chemical information to this data set, to this modeling data set. And the sum, sum of both of the black and the red line is the blue line, which nicely fit into the observation. But it's, of course, a very limited uh, data model, but um, has interesting implications. If we somehow manage to reduce, reduce the noise by 50%, it means the slope is 50% of this slope. Um, assuming that the um, uh, chemical information le learning curve is the same, has the same steepness, then we can improve the productivity of our models just by removing noise out of this. And this is a very um, um, exciting or interesting um, um, idea. And I will um, do in my time coming a little bit more um, work investigating this. Just to summarize, um, I submitted uh, or I successfully participated in the solubility challenge using our Sanofi in-house data, um, used uh, Stardrop as a winning software um, with a rated basis function as a winning method. I observed um, a bell-shaped curve of model accuracy versus number of similars and training sets and um, could show that about 50 next neighbors, uh, it's, um, it's a kind of optimal. The so intrinsic solubility itself is rele rather relevant for later drug development, but not for early drug discovery. Um, early drug discovery, like lead optimization and lead generation, um, more um, frequently uses or only uses the solubility in buffered aqueous media. And um, I want to mention that I built for our Sanofi internal uh, solubility data set a start of RBF models years ago and provided um, them to our uh, medicinal chemists. It covers nicely the Sanofi chemical space and has a size and training set of uh, roughly 65,000 uh, compounds and a decent uh, root mean square error. And every um, medicinal chemist at Sanofi can use this um, solubility at 7.4 uh, model to um, rank, order, or assess um, new virtual compounds. I want to finish with some interesting conclusions of the initiators of the solubility challenge. Um, they state uh, there is room for uh, improvement based on improving data quality of training sets. I can say this is true, as I have also shown in the model of noise uh, versus learning curve. If the training set um, gets better with less noise, we get better predictions. And we confirm again that bigger and better databases are needed, especially containing drug-like molecules. Yeah, this is also true. Um, our database um, of our pharma data almost only contains drug-like molecules. And I think this is the key um, to have a clean, consistent data with uh, drug-like molecules to successfully uh, build models for the drug-like space. I want to thank the initiators of the solubility challenge at AstraZeneca, this is Tony and Alex. I uh, want to thank very much uh, my colleagues at analytics department here at Frankfurt. Um, first of all, Michael Lotra, who is technician, the only one and only technician in the FISCHEM lab, who measured in the last years literally 100,000 um, of solubility data points um, in a very efficient and reproductive way. I thank my boss, um, Martin Will, um, uh, the, my boss of the last eight years, uh, for the freedom to operate and to um, 
do this, uh, all the modeling activities, uh, which led me to um, participate in the solubility challenge. And I uh, thank the NIME community for providing a great uh, software package that was used to, um, to prepare all the data. And um, I thank Optipre very much for uh, creating this great software of Stardrop that was um, um, deployed at Sanofi some years ago and is um, frequently used. And of course, I uh, thank Optiprium for um, the nice uh, invitation uh, to speak here at this uh, symposium. And last of, but not least, I thank the audience uh, for uh, your attention. Thank you, Peter. That was a, was a great presentation. I see we are slightly behind schedule, so just one quick question before we move on. Um, the question is, is it possible to use the solubility model instead of experimental solubility testing until an NDA? I don't think that um, um, the model um, are reliable enough and are accepted. It is great to rank order compounds. Once you have um, uh, a library of 1,000 or 1 million com or 10,000 compounds to decide which to uh, synthesize, but um, I do not th think that uh, we are already on the um, uh, in the stage to replace the experiment. Thanks for the the quick assessment, Peter, and and we might hear more about that when we come to the panel as well. With that. I would like to move to the next speaker, and I would like to introduce Tamsin Mansley. Tamsin is an experienced computational and medicinal chemist, and for the last five years has led Optibrium's North American operations, where she's working with startup users at global pharma companies, biotechs, and academia. Tamsin will demonstrate how Stardrop supports your research in a hit to lead series workflow starting with pulling data from a CDD vault. With that, Tamsin, I will hand the screen over to you. Yes, thanks very much, Tim. I hope you can see my screen. Um, and yes. thank you for the, the invitation to uh, give a demo this afternoon, uh, this morning of, uh, of our Stardrop software. Um, what you're going to see in this demonstration is that Stardrop is really a complete package of very fully integrated software in which we focus on small molecule design, optimization, and data analysis. The research that we carry out at Optibrium is into that cutting edge science and the models and the analytical methods that go into the Stardrop uh, and we make into Stardrop and we make those accessible through what you'll see as a very intuitive user interface. Stardrop is actually a modular suite of software. Uh, some of those modules are developed by us in-house, uh, others by partners who are leaders in their fields. I'm not really going to focus on that today. We'll be looking primarily at the core of Stardrop uh, and some of those key functionalities for uh, working with your data. But we do have a very flexible approach to integration and customization of Stardrop so that it can work within your research IT infrastructure. And one example of that that we'll see today is the integration with CDD Vault. And we have a global client base. Uh, a lot of people in the drug discovery area working in Stardrop, ranging from the very largest pharma companies through biotech government institutions and academia, uh, but we also have a lot of um, uptake in related fields such as agrochemicals, uh, flavors and fragrances. So I want to highlight a few of the features that I'm going to show you today. Um, first of all, the probabilistic scoring for a true multi-parameter uh, approach to analyzing your data where you'll see that we can build up a property profile, allowing us to very quickly uh, find and uh, target those high quality compounds that have a higher chance of being successful against our project objectives. And um, I'll also show ways that we can look at similarities within a data set of compounds um, 
making selections of compounds that can focus in on those that are most likely to be successful, but also bringing in diversity into the selection to help to avoid missed opportunities so that we're not, for example, making a lot of very similar compounds. We'll see um, some of the data visualization capabilities in Stardrop, um, as well as our uh, unique card view, which provides a different way of working with your data, freeing you from the constraints of the chemically aware spreadsheet and letting you think about your analysis in terms of compounds, series and relationships. And in the second part of the demo uh, later on in this webinar, what we'll look at are uh, some of the SAR analysis approaches that we have in Stardrop. Uh, I'll be showing an activity neighborhood analysis. Uh, we also have approaches like R group decomposition and matched molecular pairs, things that can really help to highlight some of those structure activity relationships in your uh, chemical series and guide lead optimization. And then, of course, it's not only about make, uh, selecting from the compounds you already have, but we will take a look at uh, the design of new compounds and see how Stardrop's glowing molecule can really help to design, uh, guide the design of compounds with the balance of properties that you're looking for. As I mentioned right at the beginning, Stardrop is a modular suite of software. We have about nine different optional modules that you can choose from to uh, extend Stardrop's capabilities through a range of predictive computation and de novo design approaches. In the demonstration today, I'll be using our ADMI-QSAR models. These are a suite of high quality uh, global models for predicting a range of ADMI and physical chemical properties that you really want to be keeping an eye on uh, throughout a project. Uh, it might not always be easy to get every compound assayed, and so this can uh, help you to think about those um, properties and use those in a multi-parameter optimization sense. And I also, um, I won't be showing it today, but I want to highlight Stardrop's auto modeler module, because there was a, a question that came in um, about, uh, from the CDD demo asking about other modeling options uh, in addition to the Bayesian one that Charlie highlighted. And so Stardrop's auto modeler module allows you to build and validate your own predictive QSAR models using a variety of machine learning techniques, uh, things like the radial basis functions that Peter was talking about in his talk. Um, but these models can really be tailored to your chemistry and data. It's designed for use by everyone. You don't need to be a, a, an expert computational chemist to use this. And then I also wanted to just talk a little bit about some of the uh, integration and customization, since that's a real theme for today's um, uh, webinar. And so you can see on the right here many of the ways that Stardrop can be integrated with other platforms and in-house tools, providing that very intuitive access for all decision makers. Um, in addition to the, the link to CDD Vault, uh, we do also have our own database query interface, which is very agnostic, providing uh, access to your data um, from a variety of different data sources for everything from relational databases through web services to flat files that you might be receiving from a CRO. And Stardrop's pose generation interface uh, allows you to run docking and alignment calculations directly from Stardrop to other third-party molecular modeling software that you license. And then uh, you can also link Stardrop directly with a lot of other third-party platforms. Uh, we'll be showing the link today with CDD Vault, but we also link with uh, commercial compound vendors, public databases, synthetic tractability assessments, a wide variety of ways to extend Stardrop's capabilities. And everything that we do in Stardrop is backed up by very rigorous science. So I do uh, encourage everyone on this webinar 
to uh, take a, a few minutes and browse through our community where you'll see uh, lots of publications about the work that we do uh, and our partners do uh, and also videos and um, case studies about Stardrop. So with that, what I'll do is I'll go into the live demonstration. And what this is going to do is focus on some uh, hit to lead uh, data set triage work, where we're going to be working with the hits from some uh, screen from, from a screen at the NK2 receptor, trying to identify uh, a couple of subsets for further follow up. So um, I hope you can see that I'm showing now the CDD vault. And what I'm looking at here is my list of saved searches. So if you remember, uh, Charlie set up a search and he saved it, and I've got access to some of the, the searches that Charlie has saved for me. And so I wanted to just show you this list because you're going to see the same list of searches uh, when we go into Stardrop. So here is Stardrop, and um, the way that I'm going to uh, open this data, of course, we can open flat files like CSV files and SD files, but I'm going to go and query CDD Vault and run a search. It's going to show me the list of those saved searches so that I can select from one of those. And the one that I want today is this NK2 primary screen. So I'll click OK. And that will go off and bring the latest data. It will rerun that search in CDD Vault, bring the latest data over into Stardrop, and display that for me here in a data set. Let me make this a little bigger for you. You'll see that we've got um, a few columns of data here. We've got structures. We've got um, compound identifiers. Uh, each of these compounds has been put into uh, a different lead series when it was registered in CDD Vault. And then we've also got this measured biological activity. You can also see on the left that Stardrop tries to show an interesting visualization for us. It's very easy to create these by clicking on column headers or by using this charts button to change the visualization that we're looking at. So now I can see that, well, on average, this amide oxine series is the most active in this data set. I can uh, detach that plot into a dashboard so that I can come back and work with that later. And what I want to do is take a look at the structural diversity in my data set. So I'll build up a chemical space. This one happens to be based on structure. They can also be based on um, differences in properties. Uh, but let's um, see that we can have several different clusters of compounds here. And each cluster contains molecules that are similar, whereas other clusters contain molecules that are more different. We can use color to represent a property or a score here. Now I've colored my active compounds yellow. And so what I can see is up here in the top left, I have a lot of uh, the active compounds. If I highlight those, those are also highlighted here in my data set. I can sort that activity column and uh, bring those up to the top. OK, um, we also can. Um, calculate properties for the compounds because it's not only about affinity. And so here on the models tab, these are all the, the star drop models. This is also where any models that you've built would be displayed, like the model Peter mentioned that he has uh, shared with all his colleagues at, um, at Sanofi. So these are global models. They can be applied to a wide range of, of projects. And for every uh, prediction that we make, we provide not only the prediction itself, but a confidence in the prediction so that you can see whether uh, this, mod this molecule is falling within the domain of applicability of your models. Now, 
at this point, I've got um, 23 columns of data, nearly 200 compounds. So I really can't start to prioritize these in my head. Let's go to the scoring area. And um, this is where we can build up a scoring profile simply by uh, dragging and dropping properties and editing the cutoff and the importance, even creating a desirability function. But I've got a saved scoring uh, profile here that describes compounds that are active in this project, having good oral bioavailability and not crossing the blood-brain barrier. Oh, this is telling me that I haven't um, set any variability on my uh, assay data. So I'm going to do that because I know that uh, if I were to test this compound again, it wouldn't be exactly uh, 9.52 uh, uh, nanomolar for the PKI. So I will set uh, plus or minus 0 0.3 uh, for the assay data. That's about a factor of two in the KI. Let me run that again. And now I can see this numerical score for each compound. It's a score from zero to one, and it's literally a probability of success. What's the probability that the compound meets all of these criteria, given the different weightings, and given the uncertainty in all the data, whether it's measured data or predicted data? This histogram is also telling me how well each of the properties is satisfied using this color key. So I can see that for this particular compound, uh, it's very active in vitro, but it's going to have some problems in vivo. It's, um, it's got lower bars for the solubility, for the human intestinal absorption. Let's sort this column and bring to the top the highest scoring compounds. And now what we can see is this compound, it has almost a 40% chance of success, which is really good for these uh, early hit compounds and much higher bars across the board. Uh, here for this compound, I might look for my opportunity to optimize it further in terms of the uh, HERG liabilities and the potential for cardiotoxicity. Now, I promised I would show you our card view. So let's go and take a look at, at that. And I want to apply a slightly different design. Uh, so I've got a saved template. You can build up these templates to really show the data that you want to see on each of these cards. Each card is representing a single compound. And I can move amongst these uh, by dragging the desktop uh, they're currently in a grid with the high scoring compounds at the top. Or I can use this mini map to jump all the way to the bottom. And here I can see my lower scoring compounds. We can color the cards like we could with a scatter plot, for example, to represent a property or a score. So let me color them by the affinity. Again, the more affine compounds will be colored yellow. And if I zoom out, now you can see that we've got active compounds scattered right through this data set. And in fact, the highest scoring uh, are not the most active. Let's look into that in a bit more detail. Let me take this high scoring compound and this other one that's also high scoring, but is more yellow, therefore more active. And I can zoom right in on those. Uh, it's very much like working in Google Maps. Now I can compare these side by side and I can see in terms of the affinity, indeed this one is one and a half log units more active, but it's significantly lower scoring due to uh, solubility, log P and HERG. Now you can have different pages to these templates. Um, perhaps put some secondary assay data or add me data on um, some of the pages. And also you can write notes. So I might want to say here, watch HERG. This note is now saved on the card. It's also saved in a new column in the data set so that when I export the data, that thought process will be captured. 
Now these two molecules look pretty similar to one another. And so I can start to consider different series of compounds, start to look at how properties are changing across a series. That one is part of that series, as is that one, but this one would be a new series. Now, of course, this can get pretty tedious, even for a couple of hundred compounds. And so, um, and so we have some analyses in Stardrop that can take the grunt work out of this for you. Things like clustering by common substructure, whole molecule similarity, or by a similarity in properties. We'll use the common substructure. And this is going to stack compounds that share a common substructure and then group together stacks that have a similar common substructure. So up here in the top of my screen, I've got these three stacks and they all have a pretty similar common substructure. They all share this quinoline and the, the phenyl ring. They differ on this substitution and on the amide nitrogen. I can fine tune this using my experience uh, on the project to um, combine those and perhaps create a single cluster called my quinoline series. You can also inspect the contents of any cluster. If there's a compound in there that you think shouldn't be there, that can be pulled out onto the desktop. If you had new compounds, of course, you can add those right in. Now, um, it's also um, possible to go and fine tune the, re the rest of my clusters there. But also, if you remember, we'd already assigned these compounds to different lead series. So let's stack by that series property. You can stack by any property in your data set. And now I've got these six different series side by side. Um, let me apply a different template here so that we can start to compare them. If I can look at these, I've got a histogram showing the uh, affinity distribution and a little box plot showing the distribution of the, the MPO scores. So this amidoxine series contains very active compounds, but they're like the ones we saw earlier. They'll be great in vitro, but I think they would struggle in vivo, and that's represented by these low scores. The peptide urea series is essentially dead very low activity. And because activity was important in our scoring profile, uh, they also have low scores. This phenylpiperazine series, though, is much more interesting. We've got um, a range of activity values. So later on, I'm going to explore the SAR in this series. And we also have some uh, higher scoring compounds. So this series looks quite promising. In fact, if we go back to the visualization tab, uh, let me recreate that chemical space and color it instead of by affinity. What I want to do is color it by the overall score for the project compounds. Again, the high scoring compounds will be colored yellow. Now there's one cluster here that's really jumping out at us containing those high scoring compounds. If I lasso around that, that's indeed my phenylpiperazine series. But I want to make sure that I'm not missing any valuable opportunities. And so there's one last plot that we can look at, and that's the snake plot. Before I do that, I'll detach this one and pop it into my dashboard. And then we'll go to the snake pot plot. And here we rank the compounds by uh, high scores on the left, low scores on the right, and the scores themselves on the y-axis. These whiskers are indicating the confidence in the overall scores. So this tells me that these compounds on the right, this half of the data set, I'm confident that these are low scoring and that my eventual drug candidate won't be amongst them. I can eliminate them uh, with confidence. This one on the left, though, my highest scoring compound, 
actually there's quite high uncertainty in that score. And so I'd have to come out to about 30 or 35 compounds in this data set, make a selection here that um, before I could be statistically certain that this highest scoring compound is better than uh, the ones that are outside my selection. So these compounds, I've selected 33. Um, I'd want to get more data about these, some measured data instead of um, uh, predicted data or get some additional replicates to increase the confidence in the data that we have. But you can see that we're selecting here from right across the chemical space so that we can really help to avoid missed opportunities. And now perhaps what I want to do is just make a copy of these into a new data set. Um, these will be my compounds for Charlie. And I've got a new tab here containing those 33 compounds. I can export those, um, save that data set as a CSV file and save those. And then what I can do is I can go back to CDD Vault. And as Charlie showed you, I can um, post a new message containing that, uh, that file there, my compounds for Charlie, and send that off to Charlie. So I'll do that uh, while we move on with the webinar, uh, and Charlie will be able to pick up those compounds later on. Camden, thanks a lot for, for this demonstration. We are definitely somewhat behind schedule, so just one very, very short question. On what structural features is the structural clustering done when it is done automatically? Is that Tanimoto or what, what options do you have there? Absolutely. So the uh, whole molecule similarity is a Tanimoto clustering um, using the, um, the fingerprints of the molecule. The property-based clustering uses a Euclidean distance between the properties. And the uh, common substructure is looking uh, really to see the proportion of the molecules that are in common with each other. So th three different methods. Thank you, Tamsin. With that, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Lisbeth Kuckemer. Lisbeth is a postdoctoral researcher at the Center of Medicine's Discovery previously part of the Structural Genomics Center in the Nuffield Department of Medicine at the University of Oxford, where she's working with enzyme crystallography and fragment screening. As part of the COVID Moonshot Consortium, she's involved in biological assays, logistics, and data capture. She will give us a behind the scenes peek at the data coordination strategies employed by this initiative. Great to have you, Lisbeth. Thank you. Okay. Just. Ah, yes, it's working. Um, so thank you for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to tell you a bit about what we are doing in our effort to get an antiviral for COVID-19. Now, since we're all living through this pandemic, I'm going to skip the customary slide of how bad the disease is and just jump straight into the science. Now, as you probably know by now, COVID-19 is caused by the virus, SARS-CoV-2. And what I have on this picture is just a representation of when the virus has infected a human host, its RNA gets translated into this long polyprotein, which needs to be chopped up into the different viral proteins for all the downstream processes. And in SARS-CoV-2, there are two polypro uh, cysteine proteases that this, does this job. The one is PL-PRO, and the other one is the main protease, M-PRO. And you can see we've just color coded in pink all PL pros cut sites and then in purple all M pros um, cut sites. Now, the COVID Moonshot project, we are very much focused on the, sec the second um, protest, M pro. Now, just to give you a bit of a timeline of how fast everything has been moving this year. So, the structure of M pro was um, solved and deposited by a group in Shanghai in the end of January already. 
they contacted Diamond and Diamond managed to produce, clone and produce the enzyme on site in Oxford by mid-February, Valentine's Day actually. And shortly after that, we had our first crystal structure at um, Diamond. The group in Weissman, under, being led by near London, managed to do a covalent fragment screen. And in Oxford, we did a crystallography um, fragment screen of about 1,500 crystals. And then by the 18th of March, we had our first 78 fragment bound structures that we released to the web. And our release was more or less on a, with a web page. We didn't follow the traditional route of depositing to the PDB or publishing a manuscript. And the reason why we didn't initially do that is because we wanted to get the data out there to the public as fast as possible so people can start using it as fast as possible. We have by now deposited all these structures to the PDB and the article has already been released. So if I just go back to the data of the fragment screen, I don't know how familiar you are with crystallography, but this gray thing here is just a representation of the enzyme. And all this colorful sticks in here is all the different fragments that bound to the enzyme. And what we've done is we just divided the active site into four sections. So as you can see here, and all I really want you to notice at this moment is that we have fragments in all four of the sections of the active site, number one. And the second thing I want you to notice is that if you look in it, there is definitely fragments that overlap with each other. So from a data point of view, this is beautiful, but the question is, so what? What do we actually do with this and how is this going to help society as a whole? And this is where we get to what was called Project Moonshot. A few of the academics got together and looking at this data set, but we have to be able to do something with this. Somewhere in the merge space, there should be a molecule that we can easily make that will be a potent inhibitor of this enzyme and hopefully being a safe antiviral. And I've been told the conversation went more or less like this. We're near London at the Weissman Institute in Israel said, but let's crowdsource ideas. Let's ask Derek Lowe, who's got a blog on drug discovery, if he will publish it and ask for smiles and maybe we can collate it all in a Google Doc. Fortunately, at that stage, um, Alpha Lee, who um, works at Cambridge instead of Pastira said, but they've got a website that they could use and for the submissions. Of course, if we've got structures, John Condera came in and said, but he's got all the tools in place to submit, submit um, rank the submissions. And if we can rank them, then we'll know what to make and not waste time unnecessarily. And then if we know what to make, then Frank Van Delft at Oxford said, but we've got resources at Diamond and at Oxford to test them. So what happened is they pulled their resources, they pulled their grant funds, and the project got born. And as we advertise it, this is the ambitious mission to produce a COVID antiviral, hence the name Moonshot. Now, how did we get went about it? We basically had this website built by Bastira. We used social media to get the word out there and made basically a submission form where we told the med chemists and all the chemists out there, it's like, listen, here's the crystal data, here's the um, fragment data, see what you can do and suggest molecules that we could make that you will think will be active. You can do your submission by smiles, you can do your submission by drawing the structure. Um, the only thing we ask you is that you will let us know how you decided to make this molecule. So what crystal structures did you use? What calculations did you use? And this is basically just a way of checking what was the rationale and what is the feasibility of this. And this then went into a normal type of free prompt cascade. We design molecules, we synthesize the molecules, we test the molecules, and we repeat the process. Now, on, this is also where CDD came into our lives, and we can see we made three projects in our CDD vault. A virtual project to um, where we capture all our design molecular ideas, a synthesis project for all the molecules that we decide we're going to synthesize, and then a made project for all the compounds that goes out to be tested. On the one side, we very much have a mid case chemist and a community that helps with designs. And on the other side of the equation, we have Inamin, who is in charge of all the synthesis for us. 
Now, of course, nothing is ever as easy as shown in a picture like this. So somewhere between the community and design phase, there is a lot of um, fact checking that needs to be done. We need to check for duplicates and submission. We need to check for sophisticated feasibility. After we've identified the molecules that we think are might be good, we have to some way, per, way prioritize them and do various analysis and docking and scoring methods to decide which ones should actually be made first and might have the highest chance of succeeding. As I said, NMN does all our synthesis for us and handles all most of us in all the synthesis records and pathways routes. They are also our inventory, so they keep stocks of all our compounds for us and send it out to the labs that we needed that. And on the other hand, we also use other CROs for to synthesize some of the compounds, and all those CROs send their compounds to NME and who then handles everything for us as a central deposit place. And then, of course, once the compounds can send out to be tested, we need to make sure that the files make sense, that we send out all the right plate maps. Another thing that happens is that once enemy ships us compounds, we not, don't necessarily know the stereochemistry yet. So there's also an iterative process of going back and fixing things like serochemistry. And then we test the compounds, we upload the data to CDD, we analyze a lot of this data on CDD. And then the process comes of pulling the data back into a public forum. So we use a lot of posterior for that and the CDD API that Charlie mentioned earlier. And then we broadcast the data. Since this is an open source project, we we really want people to know what's going on. So there's discussion forums and blogs to, in which everything gets disseminated. I just want to highlight three tools here. The one is the Frogalysis tool in which we use for crystallography, and I'll get to that again later. The other one is Postera, and Postera is really key and in, involved in managing and doing a, most of this stuff on the top end of the slide. And then we use GitHub also as a data depository for all our old data files. But since I am at the uh, assay level and I do most of this work with CDD and our assay data, what I'm going to focus on in the rest of my talk is just this little test circle in the bottom. So the next slide is a bit busy. Um, so don't worry about all the details. I'll point out what I want to say, but this is just a so an overview of our current assay cascade going from our synthesized compound to hopefully what we want to be clinical candidate in the bottom. So the first level of assays is really easy. We receive the compounds at Oxford and the Devisman Institute, and we send all of these compounds through to X-ray crystallography, to FRET assays, which is a biochemical assay, and then our MS-based biochemical assay. Each one of these blocks rep represents only one laboratory, they do a set set of compounds every single week. We get the data back in exactly the same format. To be quite honest, the uh, Weissman lab uploads it directly to CDD, so that's even easier. And we know exactly what we are looking for. So there's a very defined criteria that says, are we progressing this compound or is this the end of this compound? And at this, the, this level, it is still very much, one of us can pull a report from our CDD data, make a decision and progress it. Now, the further down the line we get into the cascade, things get a bit more murky. One of the main reasons for this is that since we are a community sourced open source project, we do not necessarily use specific CROs or specific labs for all of this, the assets downstream. And what happened, especially with the viral and the cytotox assays, is that we had labs approaching us or we had friends that we approached and asked if they were willing to test a certain amount of compounds for us. So we literally have viral labs that said, yes, I can test eight compounds for you, or yes, we can test one plate of compounds for you. The problem with this is that not all viral assays are the same. There is a wide range of different readouts, different methodologies to do it. And that also means it's a wide range of types of data and data interpretations we get back. From a data point of view, from what I'm doing, it's very, because we know we're reliant on their goodwill and because we know they offered the services for us free, 
I will can't go back and dictate and it's like, oh no, but if you want to test eight compounds for us, you need to use CDD, you need to do it in this way, you need to give me this type of upload file. I mean, that will be very unfair and very ungrateful for me, from me, to say the least. The other thing which makes this more complicated is that as soon as you have a lot of different data systems, it gets a lot more difficult to find the criteria specifically of what is interesting and what is not interesting, or what might potentially be a good compound and what would not. And the fortunate position we are in, in the COVID moonshot, is that we have the expertise of ex-pharma people, we have the expertise of a lot of med chemists and people who have actually taken drugs to market that can look at the data, look at the complete whole picture and advise us of what to do and how to proceed. And in a big case, a lot of this is a learning curve for all of us on the project, but it's really, really interesting and good. So what I'm going to do now is just show you an example of one of the viral data sets we got back. And with the link, and it's going to be a bit of a CDD ad, but just how CDD is actually making our lives a lot easier. So this is a assay plate of a viral assay. And this is actually really beautiful and a really rich data source. Now, if you look at this red columns on the outside, this is the cells, the A549 cells, that has an MGR reporter. So this is what live cells look like. When it is green, I know this probably looks yellow on your screen, that means that is the color of the virus. So the virus has got a GFP reporter in it. And if you just look at all the inside where we've tested compounds, when you see red and not yellow, like in where I'm showing my mask, that means the virus died. So that's a good thing. That means our compounds are working, the virus is dying. If you ever see black, that means our compound is also killing the cell strain that we're testing in. So that's a sign of cytotoxicity. Now the good thing with MGRE and GFP promoters is you can put it on a spec and you can get a readout. And when we uploaded this to CDD, we were actually to which we won't see visually from here, but we are actually managing to draw very nice EC50 curves for our antiviral data. And the same if we just look at the MGRE readouts, we can do the same and we can get very beautiful curves for the cytotox data. Now, why this is so exciting is firstly, because we get a lot of data from a plate which you don't visually can see. But secondly, we're getting a uniform um, output, which make it a lot easier for all our collaborators or all the people who have some interest in it or the community that wants to come back, to look at the data and say, oh yes, I know this type of plot, this is what this means. Um, so I'm, this is moving on a bit from the data and I'm just actually gonna show, tell you a few of the lessons we learned along the way and things we had to start implementing to make our vault a lot more um, easier for people from outside to use. Also taking into account we are a group from a lot of different fields. So I'm from very much a weight lab science experience, but we do have our chemists, we have our industry people, and we've got our clinicians. And not all of them are used to the same data or looking at the same data in the same way. And one of the things we actually realized there is sometimes a lot of this big discrepancy of just how we understand each other. So the one thing we've now implemented is naming conventions. So if we just look at our protocols, we have decided that all our protocols need to start off with what type of assay is it? Is it an ATMI assay? Is it an antiviral assay? Is it a cytotoxicity assay? Or is it an enzymatic assay? So that just groups it together and makes it immediately clear what we're looking at. We didn't follow this up by what, just a description of the assay. So if I look at the ATMI one, it will say it's a metabolic stability assay. Um, I'll get back to the antivirals now. Well, yeah. So getting to antivirals and to the cytotox, the first thing that's important is what cell line that we use. So you'll see we have, we'll next thing say, it's a Cali-free cell line. It was tested in Vero 6. It was tested in A549. And for the, these ones, we followed up with what was the assay type. So was it the FFU assay? Was the plug assay? Was it the imaging assay up here? And then lastly, what we list is the laboratory in which the assay was done. So I'm going to show you an example later why this makes it live very easy. And Charlie also mentioned collections. So we've actually realized that collections are a really powerful way of 
just keeping our data together. So we employ more or less the same type of naming convention, but we're using collections for our different batches that we send off to our different collaborating labs. So if I just use the antiviral again as an example, we will say that we have antiviral shipment of our second batch of compounds that we're testing that we're going to send to Oxford, and we've decided to do it on this date. So going forward now, if I need to update the tracker, I can easily go to the collection, pull the data, update my tracker. If our med chemists need to update us on in our Wednesday meeting about what's being done, he can go there, pull the data, update his presentation. The same if our clinician wants to see what we've covered and what we haven't covered, she can go in, pull the data, and very easily see, okay, listen, we've assayed these ones, but we haven't assayed the those ones, here's the problem. Another thing is because we do most of the data uploads ourselves, very, there's only one lab outside in our collaborating environment that actually use CDD for data uploads. We've realized that we have the potential of losing a lot of the info that you normally get in ELN pages and protocols and metadata. So what we started to implement was to use the ELN pages Firstly, to collect all the protocols with. But also further, because most of the assets that we, um, groups that we work with always go through the whole process of writing a report and showing what your water analysis is. As a dumping, so we basically use this as a place where we can dump their original reports and their original data. Which makes this really powerful is that if anyone ever wants to go back and query a result, they can go back to what the original lab said. And this is kind of a source document or that just verifies our data integrity. And another thing we started to do was sometimes you just get so excited about any type of data that there will be this whole long email thread that will get lost somewhere. So just this, some of these discussions just also starting to dump them into the ELN page. Now going forward, this must look like a lot of work, but we know that we are not just building it, trying to get one molecule that goes into a clinic. We are also collecting and very much aware of it, a database that can be used for machine learning protocols or that can be mined further to look at correlation between assays. So all of this data would actually be very handy to have there as a backup and for the completeness of our database for any of the downstream other so they're not the drug discovery point of view. Um, so the uses we want to use it for. And then another thing we started to do is we started doing compound tracking in the vault. So I spoke to Charlie about this and he actually suggested it just a while ago, is that we can track what assays or compounds go to by just using a normal protocol, but defining a parameter called asset type and making that a protocol condition. So this makes it easy if I want to go back and see which of our compounds have gone into antiviral assays, I can just run a search on our assay request logistics, choose my asset type as antiviral and run the search. And just to show you what our type of data upload looks like, we have a protocol defined in which we define our asset type, which laboratory we asked to do the assay. So as I said, for antiviral and cytotox, we have numerous laboratories doing this. When did we request the assay? When was it completed? And who was the person who requested the assay? And the last thing we have here is a progress um, indication. So for most biological assays, we have a very set outcome. We know it's or it's active or it's inactive. When we get to some of our other outputs like crystallography, the endpoint is never really that clearly defined. And sometimes it can just be when we have tried everything we could and we can't think of something else. So in that case, a progress bar is actually really great because we can say, yes, our comp we have a crystal structure of a compound. No, we do not have a crystal structure, but we're still trying to get one. Or no, we've, we have stopped now because we don't know what we have done exhausted all our resources to do this. And then another thing we actually also started use or misusing a lot more for our compound tracking was just the batch fields. So the first thing I want to show you is that 
we get a shipment of compounds from every enamine every week, and we number these compound shipments with the um, by shipment numbers. So shipment one to thirty-one we're up to at this moment, and by the date they were shipped. And we use this information for all our first line of assays. So we will say we send you shipment thirty, please assay this. We also use it on a crystallography side as shipment thirty has gone into crystallography. On the other hand, our plates are numbered with the shipment names. So if we ever need to go back to a compound, we can pull the data of what shipment it was, know when it went to crystallography, know when it went for basic assays, but we'll also know, okay, this is this plate in the minus 80 that we need to go look for. Just linking and making our life easy, we in the mean generates catalog numbers and batch IDs. So we've started uploading that for CDD also. So this just always makes it easier to link back from CDT to enamine with exactly the compound that we want. On the GitHub side, there's, we always have a lot of CSV files that gets generated in the whole process of making plate maps, of fixing the enantiomers, of naming. And we decided on CDD to actually have two fields where we just list all the file names that are on GitHub that is related to a specific compound. And this just, once again, just gives that easy link back to where do we go, have to go look for information and where do we find it? And then the last thing, what our MedChem has started doing in the last while, so we've got succussion links on Posterum and a lot of design rationale that's recorded. And it's, we are now also linking this into our batch fields for our compounds. So if anyone want, is wondering about anything, you can go to the batch field, see what is the posterior link you need to follow and get the data from there. And very soon we'll also be able to link our crystal data like that. So this is basically what all this type of innovation I've done is. So you remember I told you about we had specific naming conventions. And the reason we did do this is this report that I showed year was pulled by one of our, or our clinician and she want, one of our collaborators wanted to know how is her series of compounds behaving through what test did we put them because she had an NIH grant and she needed to upgrade data in NIH grant so the person could literally go put in the series pull all the data and just from what we get on the, C, uh, the CDD report know okay this is the assays that has gone through, gone into, very specific. These are assays the compounds didn't go into. This is the overlap, but also could generate a very nice report with all the IC50s and percentage inhibition values needed. So we went from having a lot of different type of viral data with different outputs to having a uniform look that anyone could understand if they quickly look at this. So this is my of course the question is so where are we today so i'm just changing shifting gears a bit so since february to where we're now in november we have built an international group of collaborators spanning three continents we had a gofundme campaign where we have managed to raise just over forty-three thousand pounds and on the compound side which is of course the important one we had four, just over 14,300 molecules submitted to the posterior site, of which just under 1,300 were synthesized and tested, and we have 211 new crystal structures with compounds bound to them. Now, what I want to show you now is just how we basically report data back to the community. So this is the posterior website. We pull the data from CDD with the API, the posterior site, where it gets plotted. You can see we've got our compounds with the names and we've got search boxes. So if you go search for the compounds, you'll see all the data that gets generated on CDD gets reported. So you can easily go as the community and go see what is your the IC50s inhibition, but you can also go and see a bit more of the rationale and a bit more of the details on the molecules as we've recorded it. Another tool I want to show you is, is uh, let me just pause quickly is our crystallography tool for analysis so we have now in the last two weeks managed to make hyperlinks that's specific for each of the compounds on this for analysis view so 
this was worth just once again going through the Postero website. If you go find your favorite compound, you click on the view and frugalysis, it will open this browser. So I'm just showing you this. This is our viewing of crystallography data browser. This thing you see here is the enzyme. And you will soon see popping up here, it will tell you all the different sites where we have compounds and we'll list on this side all the different compounds that is bound in this crystal structure. It's, yeah, there it pops up. And then it shows you in a 3D way where how your compound is bound, what their actual interactions form. And as you can see, just from moving around, this is interactive. So you can turn it to whatever way you need to. Now both Postero and both Rogalysis, there is a lot more to say, and I won't do anything just, I'm not doing anything justice to it now. But if you're interested, please contact us. We're more than happy to talk about this. And then the last thing I want to end up with, I just want to give you an idea of the process. So if you were a user out there and you've submitted a molecule, what would have happened? So this molecule here was submitted just as the start of, of the Moonshot project. It was a contributor to Fon Sarganis and Oxford University. And you can see what we immediately do is we link, give the compound a name that is linked back to its designer. So TRA being the first three letters of his name. And he listed himself as being from University of Oxford. So when it pulled in his origin, it pulled in UNI as where he was from. And when he submitted this molecule, he gave us a rationale saying that it was based on these fragments in the original fragment screen. And it shows us some of these fragments. And then just from the posterior side, you can see we've annotated and says this is a free amino pyridine like molecule. Of course, it's now a bit down the line, so we already know it's acid. So what happened to this molecule? Well, this molecule, as I said, was submitted on 17th of March. It took us a whole 57 days to go from when it was submitted to having final data as it out, which is fine. This was our first round of doing all of this. Everything was still being in the process of being set up, being optimized, um, growing pains, basically. And when we assayed it, it had a mediocre IC50 of 24 micromoles. Not that great. But as the design process got on, we started building and changing this molecule. And this we got to where we are today, where we've got this pentapyridine with IC50 of 114 nanomolars. So all of a sudden, this is a lot more promising than our original it. And this is also now the scaffold that we do using for our lead series. The other thing you will notice is our turnaround time was basically almost a third of what it was in the beginning. So I know this is not a drug, but this is the molecule that we're basically doing our SAR on, and which we are sending now for initial viral and ACME um, profiling. And I think all I can tell you is watch this space, and with space, um, we'll probably refer you back to the Postero website. There might be something interesting coming out. And with that, very mostly. I just need to thank everyone. So the Moonshot Consortium is quite a big consortium and in efforts for me not to leave out any names, I just pasted in the author list from the bioarchive paper we have on this process. And then of course, I want to say a specific thank you to Mariana, Susanna and Charlie, who was really awesome and helping us set up our CDD vault and supporting us all the way through and is still on a regular basis answering questions for us on all of this. And with that, I'll hand back over. Thank you, Lisbeth. Great presentation, great initiative. We take the time for one quick question. The question is, would you think it needs a pandemic to make such an effort possible, or would you think that that can be replicate for, replicated for other areas as well? I think it needed a pandemic for us to realize we can do it. So it can definitely be replicated, and we're hoping it will be replicated. Um, the one thing that I have to say is that we've got amazing PIs on our team who's really highly energetic. So I don't know how many people can always keep up with them. But yeah, as I say, I would really hope we can replicate this for other um, diseases and other disease models. 
will be definitely interesting to follow that and see how that develops in the future. Thanks again, Nisbe. With that, I would like to um, hand the screen back over to, to Tamsin, who will give us um, an additional demonstration looking at how Stardrop supports your um, hit to lead work. Um, oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Obviously that we already have seen. So Tamsin will now move to the next phase and showcase some highlights around uh, lead optimization and design. With that, over to you, Tamsin. Thanks very much, Tim. And I hope you can see Stardrop again. Uh, this is exactly where we left off. And uh, I'm going to show some uh, examples of the lead optimization approaches we have in Stardrop, um, as well as the uh, design and the glowing molecule. Um, before I start, I really enjoyed uh, Lisbeth's presentation. It's always so nice to see examples of where uh, different groups at different sites are able to collaborate with each other uh, to produce something that's um, the whole is, is so much greater than the individual parts. Um, okay, so we've got many approaches to start uh, to SAR analysis in Stardrop, uh, things like R group analysis, uh, matched molecular pairs analysis. I'm going to show you just one today that you might not be uh, familiar with, and that's our activity neighborhood. And I want to do that using this phenylpiperazine series that we had identified as being a, pro a promising series in which we would uh, have a range of activities so that we could explore the structure activity relationships. Let me select that series and then take that over and make a copy of that into a new uh, data set, a new tab. I'm going to simply order these with the highest scoring compound at the top because I want to use this high scoring compound as the reference for the activity neighborhood. And I'm going to also change the template to one that I saved earlier um, showing just some slightly different data on the face of the cards here. The activity neighborhood is another one of the analyses that are available here in, in Stardrop. Uh, it's, uh, so if I select that, you can see that what we're going to do is identify the 10 nearest neighbors to that reference compound. This is using a Tanimoto 2D whole molecule similarity. And we're going to link those 10 compounds to the reference and color the links based on a difference in affinity. And when I uh, carry out the analysis, what I get is this, um, this spiral layout. In the center is the reference compound. You can see it's still highlighted with this blue border. To the right is the compound with the highest Tanimoto similarity to that reference and they spiral out with decreasing structural similarity. These arrows are indicating the difference in affinity for each pair of compounds. You can see that sometimes they point in and sometimes they point out. They're always pointing to the more affine compound in each pair. And then the color is representing the magnitude of the difference. So over here on the left, I have a gray arrow Let's zoom in and compare those two compounds. And what you can see is the affinity for them is very similar. But here on the right, there's an, an red arrow pointing to another compound. And this is, it happens to be the one we saw earlier with that one and a half log units difference in activity. So this activity neighborhood has helped us very easily to identify an activity cliff, two compounds, that are structurally similar, but have a big difference in activity. In fact, if I zoom in um, a little bit further, we can compare the two side by side. Um, in spite of the fact that uh, the compound is uh, more active, the compound on the right, it's significantly lower scoring. Uh, and that's because of the solubility log P and the Herg affinity. The structural difference, though, is simply a, a pyrrole ring going to a benzene ring. So clearly, there's something the receptor likes about this benzene ring, 
And so I'd like to keep that in the molecule, but it's imparting additional lipophilicity and raising the risk of Herg-related uh, cardiotoxicity. If I click on this Herg property, I can see the glowing molecule associated with that. And I can see it a little bit larger over here in the design window where we can get a copy of that molecule and start to explore our design ideas in, uh, in this sandbox. So just to explain the glowing molecule a little bit, the red areas are parts of the structure that are having a big impact on raising that prediction for the Herg affinity whilst these two blue areas are having a big impact on lowering the prediction. I can see I've got a lot of red, especially here in the bottom right of the molecule. This uh, benzylic amine is a very classic Herg pharmacophore. Perhaps what I could do is uh, try to remove the lipophilicity around the amine by converting it to an amide. I'm going to use these sketching tools above the structure to make that change. And as I do so, you'll see that the predictions for the molecule in the design area will update on the fly and the glow will also change. So I can simply click and drag to bring in this um, new double bond and convert that to an amide. Let's compare that now with the original parent structure and um, I can immediately see I've got less red here. I've added some more blue. The Herg prediction is uh, the PIC50 is now 5.7, which is closer to what we're interested in looking at um, compared to the 6.7 that we started with. For log P, um, we can see a similar trend where we've taken some of that red, reduced that down, added some blue, and reduced the overall log P of the molecule. So this seems to have that balance of properties that I'm looking for to create a higher scoring compound. I can use the blue arrow now to add it to my data set, or I could put it into a, a brand new data set. Let me go back to the table where we can see this new compound added in. Um, of course, we've um, calculated all of the, the different properties for this compound. The biological uh, measured affinity is missing uh, because this is a virtual compound. Um, so we've had a go at scoring it, but this is opaque to indicate to me that there's some missing data. Of course, this would be a great example of where um, one of Stardrop's auto modeler mod models to predict the affinity of your series would be particularly useful. And then, of course, what I can do is I can just give this some sort of virtual ID to help me start to track my ideas here in Stardrop. It will, of course, get a, a proper ID when it gets registered into, um, into CDD Vault. If I want to register this particular compound, of course, I would put that into a new data set where I want to collect my virtual compounds. And then eventually when I'm ready, I can export that out and uh, send that over to Charlie. And so just to show you, I've got um, a couple of emails that I sent to him uh, earlier where we've got one with those 33 compounds that I had before and one in which I've um, saved a CSV file containing my new idea and uploaded that. So um, that's the point that I wanted to, to um, end this second demo where we've carried out some structure activity relationships on our original uh, data set with uh, focusing in on one single lead series and then coming up with a hypothesis for the design of a new compound to overcome a particular liability in that series. Thank you, Tamsin. We take the, the time for, for one quick question before we move to the next demo. The question is, uh, this glowing molecule, does that work with in-house and third-party models as well? 
Oh, that's a great question, Tim. So currently the glowing molecule is available for all the models in Stardrop's uh, ADMI QSAR uh, set of models. Um, so using the ADMI QSAR module, as well as these simple properties. Um, if you license the uh, direct nexus module for toxicity predictions uh, with Stardrop, you can also see a glowing molecule associated with those. And the glow is also available for um, Stardrop's predictions from models made with Stardrop's automodeler module. It's also available for scoring functions where all of the properties are predicted data from those sources. Now, in the next release of Stardrop that we're looking forward to uh, early in 2021, we are adding the ability to bring in the glow for third party models, providing that they um, have uh, report data with atom based contributions to the overall property. Um, so the answer there is going to be maybe for the third party models. It will depend on the format of those models. Perfect. Thanks, Tamsin. That's definitely something to look forward to. With that, I will hand the screen back over to Charlie, who will close the loop demonstrating how you can share those optimized and newly designed compounds with your colleagues using the vault. All right, thank you very much. So thank you, Tamsin. Uh, I have indeed received your uh, two messages here, uh, both within the message board of our um, collaborative CDD vault, but also um, uh, in my normal email where I could have uh, grabbed that, clicked through and come directly here to this message. So I can uh, download this CSV file directly to my computer now uh, that Tamsin has that available and navigate straight over to the import data tab where I can go through this quick three-step process of choosing my data file, mapping the fields from the data file into my CDD vault and choosing whether to commit or reject that data. So choosing the file is the first step. I will go to the new idea here in my downloads folder and put that into an NK2 project that is shared with my collaborators within this vault. I will upload that CSV file here into the server and choose to register this as a new molecule uh, with a structure. And you will see here that uh, we have a chemical structure that I will apply the mapping to. We can save this as a template, so all of this mapping can happen in a quick um, one click, uh, even if there are additional data properties coming in that I wish to map to those various fields and protocol definitions within my vault. Um, so this bulk registration, bulk import process uh, works with all of the data um, being imported and registered into the CD vault. I'll now process this. Should go very quickly. We have a, a quick status area where that is queued. In a moment, it will come back and tell me if I click the big green commit button, I will get um, this magic thing. And the magic thing now is one new molecule will be created. Um, at any point, if I wish to reject here, I could uh, not import or accept this data, walk away, and nothing would have been changed. But this is a, a very clean import, of course. So I have committed that. And now I will get a final commit report that includes a link to visualize the data that I just imported. So that's the workflow here. I can take that through. I could explore that data. Um, here's the one structure that we created. And if I wanted, again, to create a collection now, um, as um, I mentioned before, and uh, Lisbe also mentioned that the Moonshot collaborators are using collections to communicate um, sets of compounds throughout the uh, global collaborate, collaborative um, uh, organization, uh, I could go ahead and create a collection to send this molecule on its merry way uh, for testing and other uh, analyses that may be needed. So that is it. And um, yeah, back to you, Tim. Perfect. Thanks, Charlie. One last question before the panel. Um, if I'm currently using .matrix, how straightforward is it to convert to CDD? <laughs> 
So um, we are um, offering data migration services packages. So we uh, absolutely help customers uh, migrate existing data from other packages and, and other platforms into CDD Vault. So uh, not only .matics, other systems as well. Uh, we've done uh, many of these as customers have come over into CDD Vault. Um, we can, you know, uh, leverage a lot of tools that we have, uh, whether it's that API to, to automate some of that uh, uh, transfer of data or exporting files and importing files like I just uh, uh, demonstrated the very easy bulk import and bulk registration of, of compounds and data from other systems into CDD Vault. So we're very confident that we can uh, help customers who wish to move uh, data from a variety of platforms into CDD Vault. Thank you, Charlie. That's great to hear. With that, um, before we come to the panel, just a brief reminder, we will follow up on the questions we have received that we couldn't touch upon during the presentations itself. Um, and please continue using the, the questions panel uh, to, to interact with our panel as well. Yeah, with that, I would like to, um, to introduce our panelists. Um, Matt Siegel and Barry Bunin will join our guest speakers, Lisbeth and Peter. Matt is the CEO of Optibrium and has more than 20 years of experience in drug discovery services and software development. Since his PhD from the University of Cambridge in theoretical physics, his scientific focus has been on decision analysis and predictive modeling to improve the efficiency and productivity of drug discovery. Barry is the founder and CEO of Collaborative Drug Discovery based in San Francisco. CDD being his second company after Libraria, Barry's vision of CDD Vault in 2004 was to provide a hosted database solution for chemists and biologists in which to collaborate internally and externally globally in several key humanitarian research initiatives. Barry has led CDD Vault as a recognized brand for drug discovery data management with continued success year after year with additions of continuous enhancements, including a fully integrated ELN we have seen earlier, to the core platform. Barry's leadership is also driving success in biologics and other entity handling within CDD Vault. With that, I would like to ask our panelists to uh, perhaps open their, their webcams. And I would like to, um, to open um, with with Matt. So Matt, would you give us your brief introduction on how you would see the next frontier uh, of informatics and drug discovery? Thanks a lot, Tim, and uh, a big thanks to Elizabeth and Peter for great presentations, and and also to uh, to Charlie and Tanzan for their demos today. And I've really enjoyed the the, the discussions and the questions in between as well. Um, yeah, so it's it's a really good question. That the next frontier of, of chem informatics. Um, I guess where I'd start is that uh, the chem informatics algorithms are, are really important to, to guide selection and design of compounds and drug discovery. We've seen examples of data management and, and how then to analyze and, and work with that data. Um, you know, so they include models. You see a great example presented by Peter, sort of SAR analyses like activity neighborhoods, and, and Tamsin showed an example of that. Uh, more recent methods like generative chemistry approaches and, and all sorts of different things. Um, but I guess, uh, in my opinion, they're, they're just a starting point. Um, you know, to really get the value from these, I think it's absolutely essential to deliver these chem informatics methods directly to the key decision makers in a project. And, uh, and I guess more often than not, they're experimental scientists, you know, medicinal chemists, biologists, and, and other project scientists. Um, and, and what that means is that we need to make these really sophisticated algorithms very, very easily accessible right on the desktops of, of those key decision makers. And I think even more important than that, the results that come back need to be very intuitive, um, that they need to just, just make sense in the context of, of your projects and the decisions that you're making. And, and I guess I hope you've seen a, a few examples of that in, in our Stardrop software and, and the demos that, that, that Tamsin gave. But uh, I think the world is changing and moving on, and, and I think this is even more important in this sort of new world we're entering of sort of artificial intelligence for drug discovery. Um, you know, I, I think that at least in my opinion, we're a long way from AI methods replacing experienced scientists for the foreseeable future. And it, it, I don't think uh, any computer is going to go ping, here's the molecule, now go make, now go synthesize it and be your drug. Um, 
I think it really is the combination of human expertise and these new AI algorithms that are going to give the best outcomes. Um, you know, I think people are really good at, at taking a strategic overview uh, based on an understanding of project objectives, the biology, the chemistry. Um, on the other hand, AI methods are very good at performing a very rigorous, very objective tactical analysis of those different strategic options. And in, I guess this is a principle that's pretty well known. Um, I, in the AI world, it's known as augmented intelligence. Um, and we've seen examples of that in everything from sort of chess to, to radiology and diagnostics. And you know, one of the things that we're really focusing on is taking this idea and applying it to drug discovery. This is what we describe as augmented chemistry. Um, and you know, nowadays, you know, we all expect the technology that we work with to sort of understand what we're trying to do, understand our objectives, and then very proactively present sort of interesting patterns, valuable conclusions that, that will guide us to our objectives. And I think um, you know, this idea is something that's going to be really important for the, for the future of chemistry. That's a little bit of a perspective from, from where I'm sitting anyway. Thanks, Matt. And, and Peter, I, I would expect that that partly resonates with you as well after showing us kind of the domain expertise you included in, in order to, to get those good predictive models for, for the solubility challenge. But where would you see the, the next frontiers? Yeah, thanks, uh, Tim. Yeah, I think uh, we create information at more and more accelerating speeds. And I think a little bit we face a problem of translating this uh, big chunk of information into knowledge and this knowledge further into value. And um, I'm an ex experienced data scientist at pharmaceutical industry, and I know that there are hidden treasuries in our corporate databases, which just are waiting to be mined by us. And a good example, as I have shown today, is a competition of last year, the solubility challenge. Um, what I want to um, mention is that the molecular properties, uh, uh, so um, intrinsic solubility was not itself available at our database, only the solubility at different aqueous media and just information deposited somewhere. Um, I converted this solubility information into the new property, uh, intrinsic solubility, and this was really new knowledge creation. Yeah? And um, this knowledge was then uh, able to be um, applied and to create value as one of the best uh, predictions. And this is a very uh, instructive example how existing information can be um, transferred into knowledge and later into value. Um, there are currently many initiatives ongoing to prepare data to reuse such big data holdings uh, as I have shown. And um, in the last year, there were developed a set of principles called FAIR, F-A-I-R. F, -A -I -R. F stands for findable, A for accessible, I for interoperable, and R for reusable. And one key steps to implement these FAIR principles um, is to standardize and harmonize data. Um, in my experience, even in superficially uniform research or organizations, an astonishing diversity in data and experimental conditions can be observed over time, um, especially after serv several subsequent mergers. Standardization is the only way not to lose information over the time in huge data dumps. And this requires continuous effort and resources as well as coordinated corporate data management strategies. Thank you, Peter. This way, I think the, the idea of this, this FAIR concept that probably resonates very well with, with some of the work we have seen in your presentation. So what is your take? Well, we try a lot to close the gaps as it is. Um, I think we showed a nice example of we had all this crystal data and what to do with it. But I mean, that's not the only gaps we have. The other gaps is on the synthesis side. How do we quickly get molecules? And our group actually also is involved in a lot of the AI type of things. I think there's so much knowledge out there, as um, Peter also just said, and what can we learn from that? But then on the other side, as I'm a, I'm a lab rat, I know AI and everything works, but I'll never really trust it until I have that wet lab output in the end to say this is right. But then, as we've now come to realize, wet lab is expensive, it takes time. So, it would be great just to get to that collaborative space of where we can 
smartly choose what we do and what we progress um, in a way as, yeah, bit of getting a like, kind of streamlined funnel going. So I would, yeah, I would really hope for that actually in the process. Thanks, Liz Bay. That gets us to, to you, Barry. And, and I think we, we heard that uh, already in, in your introduction, you're coming from a very collaborative angle. So I guess what, what Liz Bay was saying must resonate with you as well. You might be on mute still, Barry. I thought you had control to the mute. Uh, here I am in California. Good morning, everyone internationally. Thank you, Optibrium, for having CDDS uh, you know, co-host here for your, your party. Um, so when I started CDD back in 2004, I didn't imagine you know, there'd be a pandemic in 2020 and seeing uh, Elizabeth's presentation is sort of you know, a culmination of this concept of getting scientists to work together and collaborate. Uh, through the internet, so um, it it is um, inspiring to see, and I think with a lot of what uh, Optibrium provides in terms of the more sophisticated analytics and modeling um, in in that area, very nicely complements uh, our focus and obsession on the quality of the data, and. Uh, making it very easy for chemists or biologists or people between different organizations with different business roles to all collaborate and have the data on the same page. So um, I thought for my introduction, because uh, I'm here at home with my bookshelf, uh, I just grabbed uh, one of the books from college, this one, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance for a little philosophy uh, and inquiry into values. So one thing Robert Piercig talks about is um, the quality of uh, papers uh, written by college students. And even though uh, you know, everyone might have a different opinion, there clearly is a, a quality, the A level papers and the D level papers. And I think the same thing's true in, in data. So this, the ideas uh, of fair data that Peter was uh, just talking about. Uh, so being able to have the, the quality of the data, the providence of the data, and you can quantitate that. You can quantitate that with things like uh, numbers around IC50 curves or the plate data. So we've really focused on just ensuring that scientists anywhere can bring their own intelligence, their own expertise, their own algorithms, and get that you know, really healthy uh, different perspectives between chemists and biologists or different organizations as we've seen in some of these collaborations. So that's my brief introduction back, back to you. <laughs> Thanks for unmuting me. Thanks, thanks, Barry. Um, to 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 get in the the questions from the audience as well. So I think Matt, from from you, we have heard this idea of of augmented um, instead of just artificial intelligence to really have something which is accepted by by the actual chemist, for example. I think Lisbeth, you you echoed that that sentiment very clearly as well. Um, and particularly looking at at people with with lab experience like like you, Lisbeth, and Peter. There was the question, how do you see uh, the, the onset of AI taking over the lab? So where you have automated synthesis cycles and all that, uh, where you, you kind of pull out the, the chemist out of the, the work and you have to kind of trust that the black box is doing what it's supposed to and everything looks fine. So what, what is your uh, expectation there? Maybe starting with Lispe and then over to, to Peter. Yeah, sorry, I'm struggling to unmute myself. Um, I don't think I will ever trust the black box to just do what it says. Um, what I like of the black box is just so that it gives us good starting points and uh, of where to go. If I think when, like in my lab experience, when I, okay, I did synthesis in my uh, for my PhD, we took a long time to go through the whole retro synthesis process of figuring out how to do it, what compounds to use, what not to use, and that whole organic chemistry textbook that you basically had to remember. And for me, in a sense, AI makes that easier because it can have this experience and it can pull easier from all the databases is what knowledge is out there. And come, hopefully, instead of a single person sitting there working out for days for a register synthesis, come up with proposed synthetic routes. 
but then in the end, I would still want to see my NMR. I would still want to see my um, MS trace. I'm not going to trust what's there. I'll probably even, since enantiomers is one of our problems, want to see our um, optical rotations before I go close to trusting what the black box is telling me. But yeah, that is speaking as a lab scientist in totality. Thanks for staying. Peter, what is, what is your take on that? Yeah, we at Sanofi here, especially in Frankfurt, but also other sites at Sanofi, have really a lot of experienced medicinal chemists. Uh, some of them old school um, uh, started to design compounds with a pencil and uh, paper. Some of them um, more um, prone to uh, new technologies like uh, Stardrop. But I have also examples of um, really experienced uh, medicinal chemists with uh, a uh, long experience um, who really liked to switch to Stardrop to use it uh, to present their data sets um, and to fill gaps or to, to use it to fill gaps which are, uh, are existing in the SAR. Although I think um, especially these experienced uh, medicinal chemists will not um, completely trust, trust a black box they will rather use the um, uh, software proposals for molecules to make uh, just as a proposal um, and to uh, align it with their own um, experience to decide whether to make or not. I think um, until we can replace experienced metal cell chemists, we need at least 100 additional 100 years of development of AI or 50 years. That's that's definitely encouraging to hear. I guess for all the medicinal chemists uh, in the audience today as well, uh, that's not going away anytime soon. Um, maybe coming back to uh, to to the fair principle as well and, and data sharing a bit, um, Barry. What would your vision be in terms of maybe seeing more bigger consortia, maybe akin to what Lisbeth is working with, and seeing more data sharing? Um, and, and efforts in, in making data sets comparable to really further what the industry is doing. Yeah, so I think what the technologies and tools do is they lower the activation barrier. They make it easier to get your data up, make it easier to share. And collaboration really is ubiquitous. There's no one person in the world who just discovered a drug by themselves. And so whether that's within an organization, commercially, privately, um, or in areas where um, you don't really care which horse wins as long as one does, such as neglected diseases or in the pandemic. Uh, Bill Gates quipped that you know, if your, your mom has cancer, you don't care if the cancer drug was discovered in England or China or United States, you just want your mom to have a cancer drug. So um, I, I do think there's always been this, even from the early days of Merck, this, um, dual driver of economics and altruism throughout drug discovery and what the tools and technologies do and just the whole birth of the internet it allows the theory of any scientist to collaborate with any other one in the world and then what the tools do here is they allow you to do that um, securely through the internet um, i also want to harken back to what uh, matt said about you know uh, augmented intelligence until there is a to the last question until there is a uh, a super intelligence that supersedes everything humans do, which you know people debate whether that's even possible or when. Um, you know, it's not considered a foreseeable future thing. Um, medicinal chemistry and synthetic chemistry—they're very hard fields to um, predict. Back to you know EJ Corey's early work, and part of it is because they're so experimental and empirical, and there's there's noise in the data, and you have these feedback loops. So. Um, there are certainly are efforts to try to uh, automate aspects of synthesis and medicinal chemistry, and the tools help. Um, but you know, we're far away from not needing humans. It just makes humans' jobs a lot easier. So, so Matt, maybe bouncing that back to you. So, so how do you see uh, your customers using such tools today? So, what what are their demands as well concerning data sharing? Yeah, so so with respect to data sharing is 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 really really important. Um, you know, bringing together. I, I think actually uh, both, both Peter and, and Lisbeth raised the, the, the point very very nicely. Is it it's it's the gaps in the knowledge, um, or 
more importantly, how we bring together all the knowledge that we have um, and, and actually use that in the context of our own specific project and our own specific objectives. I think that that's absolutely really, really important. Um, so bringing together data is important, but also one of the big challenges there is that harmonization. Um, yeah, Elizabeth, you, you described it very nicely in your presentation. You, you get data from all different labs measured in slightly different ways and, and how comparable you know, are they? How do we actually make sense of them? So there's all sorts of interesting approaches for doing that. Um, again, I think some of the sort of the, the AI approaches could help us there. Um, you know, one thing AI is very good at is pattern recognition um, and, and doing that across very large, diverse data sets. Uh, so we've been working on a method called uh, imputation using sort of deep learning. Um, and what that means, you don't have to do a sort of an artificial amalgamation of that data. You can actually treat the different data sources as independent but recognize the relationships between them. Um, and so I think, yes, this is this is where we, we can get a lot of value from some of these, these fancy new algorithms. Uh, but I do want to emphasize uh, exactly what, what Lisbon and Peter are saying, you know, we're, we're not in a situation where the algorithms are going to replace people. Um, you know, that blend of expertise and the, the, the computational methods is, is really where you're going to get the, the ultimate best return. Thank you, Matt. I think in the in the interest of time, seeing that we are in principle already in overtime, I, I would like to, to use that as a, as a closing statement. I think what we've heard from, from all four of you is, is a very collaborative future you are seeing, both in terms of methods employed as well as connecting people and efforts. So I'm, I'm definitely uh, hoping that that will materialize very soon and I'm, I'm very keen on seeing that. So with that, all uh, that is left to say is really uh, a gr great thank you to, to all the speakers today, uh, particularly our two, two guest speakers, Liz Bay and Peter. It was, it was great to have you and uh, to, to see, here, see and hear your perspectives. Um, I think if, I hope you, you got a good uh, impression as well on what, what uh, CDD, uh, the, the Vault and Stardrop uh, can do for you in order to help you with your own drug discovery process. And in case uh, you want to get in touch with us, uh, please reach out by, by email, either via info at optimium.com or via info at collaborativedrug.com. At the same time, if you have follow-up questions for, for Lisbe or Peter, please don't hesitate to, to get in touch uh, with Optibrium and CDD, and we will uh, happily route on all the, the incoming connection requests uh, so that you can then get in touch with, with both Lisbeth and Peter. With that, again, a great thank you to, to our presenters, to all you in the audience who made it a very lively uh, event. So thank you for, for your questions uh, and your, your feedback. And yeah, we hope to see you soon on one of our upcoming events. With that, have a great day ahead. <laughs>